Good afternoon, Saitlanders. How are you? Hope that you're well. Let me just do this and see if it works. Oops, wrong way, as usual. Uh, there we go. I think that's a little bit better. Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, the reason behind uh, why the rand hasn't fallen in, the, let's say, the past year. Why the the value of the rand has not deteriorated or even collapsed as South Africa has gone through many tremendous ructions, whether they were related to COVID-19 and the lockdown or shenanigans within the ANC or uh, trouble in our economy unrelated to the lockdown a shortfall of money in the fiscus, that's to say the money that, uh, the, the, the state's money, or whatever. And the answer is not all that complicated, but it is a bit of a long story. And I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, you all know about Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest is uh, stories condensed. Um, uh, written in the English uh, correct word is pricey, where you just take all of the, the most relevant details of any story, so you don't lose any of the facts, figures, data, the, the salient information, but you compress it or you reduce it very, very much. Uh, so here goes. In... World War II, the United States sponsored, you could say, a lot of help in materiel and men and logistics and so on to the Allied nations, particularly the Soviet Union, particularly. The, the uh, global champion of capitalism was also the great sponsor of communism. It's something that, that uh, the mainstream media seldom mentions. I'll give you another example just to give you a sense of perspective on this. Whenever you hear a story of World War II, you hear about uh, Hitler invading Poland on the 1st of September 1939 and how that precipitated World War II. Hitler, Germany, bad guys. What they seldom mention is that 17 years later, Joseph Stalin, oh, 17 years, 17 days later, 17 days later, the USSR also invaded Poland and Germany kept 49% uh, and the USSR took the bulk, 51%. But somehow that's always overlooked. That was the product of an agreement between the two foreign ministers of Germany and the Soviets, the USSR, in uh, 1939, if I'm not mistaken, called the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which was more or less kept a secret until 19, 1989, in August of 1989, an Estonian guy, found it in the uh, archives, uh, Soviet archives, and um, he was very indignant about it because it provided the illegal basis for the occupation of the three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. This is getting a little bit complicated, but I'm going to simplify it for you in a minute. And so in August, I think, uh, I can't remember, I think the 23rd of August, 1989, he got hold of this thing 
and we started to speak about it. And then by about the 16th of November, I think, 1989, it became a genuine scandal. And, you know, August and November of 1989. So, the, I'm not saying Germany was good. I'm not saying the Holocaust does that. I'm just providing you the facts, which maybe give you a slightly different perspective on the idea that there are going to be in this story that I'm telling you about why the South African RAND has not collapsed over the past year. Some things that are difficult to believe, but which are true. Okay, so in return for all of this help to the Allied Nations, the other Allied Nations, there were 44 in total. So in return for the help uh, to the other 43, the U.S. demanded gold and nothing but gold. By 1944, the middle of 1944, just a year before the end of World War II, the U.S. controlled two-thirds of the world's gold at a time when currencies uh, were meant to be backed by gold. In other words, you couldn't print monopoly money on a Xerox machine, as the USA is doing now, and say this has value. You had to have the gold to back it. Otherwise, your currency was just paper. Simple as that. So, the Allied countries, who had been largely exhausted by the efforts of World War II, and the demands placed upon them. We're sitting in a situation where their economies would, by traditional standards, collapse without that gold. Because the economies are very closely tied to finance and economics are closely tied together. You've got to have a currency worth something. And that worth has to be dictated by something of value, not paper. Right? Gold. So... From the 1st of July to the 22nd of July, 730, 730 or 732 delegates of the 44, all 44, 43 beneficiaries and one sponsor or donor, if you like, the USA, met at Bretton Woods in a hotel, don't remember the name, uh, in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in the USA to figure out a solution to this impending crisis. By then, they knew very well, um, looking at my dog out the window, he's run across the road, he's naughty. Um, by then, uh, they knew that they were going to win World War II. The writing was on the wall. The D-Day invasion had taken place just a few weeks before, and there was this great surge from the West and from the East by the Soviets against the, uh, against the uh, let's say, Germany, to, to keep it simple. It was more than that. It was Germany, uh, Austria, uh, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and it had been Italy. So there were about six uh, European Axis powers. And they thrashed out a system, an agreement, whereby the USA alone would maintain its currency based upon its gold reserves. So we've taken all of your gold. We will keep it. Our currency will be backed by it, the US dollar. And then you guys link your currencies to ours. And everything will be okay. At the same time, uh, they set up the International Monetary Fund. And the, I think it's called the Bank for International Reconstruction and Development or the International Reconstruction and Development Bank which kind of more or less became the World Bank. Not exactly, but roughly. Okay. 
they, by 1945, uh, the, so the agreement was signed on the 22nd of July, 1944. By 1945, that system kicked off and it worked until 1971, when the uh, 1970-71, when uh, stagflation, I won't go into the details, but when there was a period of stagflation in the world, countries began to uh, demand, basically, they weren't willing for uh, the, the US dollar to determine and dictate the value of their currencies. So there's this link, always this link. If the one goes up, the other, there's always a relationship. The one dictates the status of all of the others. And they wanted gold instead of paper from the USA in certain dealings, certain transactions, whatever. So Richard Nixon, the then president, on Friday the 13th of August 1971, held a big meeting uh, with his financial boffins in which they came to the drastic conclusion that they had no choice but to take the US dollar off the gold standard. And he announced it on Sunday the 15th of August so that the markets couldn't react so that there would be kind of a 24-hour grace period um, for people to get over the shock of this idea that now all of the currencies in the world or the majority of the meaningful, substantial Western currencies of the world were backed by nothing. Initially backed by nothing, but backed by the USA's dollar, which was backed by something, and now certainly backed by nothing, no matter how you looked at it. So, the USA then began to frantically, in order to justify the, that the dollar had any value to it, it began to make the most of an agreement, another agreement reached during World War II or just after. That is to say, in 1945, the USA said to the Saudis, Saudi Arabia, producers of the world's uh, most oil. Of course, things have changed a little bit, but to keep it simple, the famous Saudi Arabia, the, the big oil guys, they said, look, you guys don't have much going for you except this oil. Who's going to look after you if the Iraqis or the Iranis get fed up with you and they invade? Why don't you let us provide you with infrastructure, uh, with airfields, this, that, the next thing. The Saudis said, fantastic. What do you want in return? The Americans said, every time you sell a barrel of oil, you and your friends, you must charge for it in US dollars. Not only price it in US dollars, but accept payment only in US dollars. So in the past, you might have priced the barrel at, let's say, uh, one US dollar. And a South African guy comes along. He says, I want 10 barrels. And the South African rand is, let's say, for the purposes of simplicity, worth a dollar. So 10 barrels, I'll give you 10, 10 rand. Or oh, it's only worth half a dollar. I want 10 barrels, I'll give you 20 rand. It's the same thing as $10. So they were not only to price it in dollars. They were to receive payment in dollars and dollars only. Hence the expression, the petrodollar. And from 1971 onwards, that became, among one or two other things, the basis for the strength of the US dollar, the substantiation of the value of the US dollar in the absence of a gold standard. Another thing that helped very much was that the dollar was the designated currency of, um, oh, there's an there's a expression for it, currency of last resort or something like that. 
Meaning that at the, at the end of the day, all things are settled in dollars. Right. So there's an, an artificial demand. There's a... Um, a uh, uh, a, a, a contrived, that's the word, a contrived demand. The dollar is valuable because everybody has to have dollars to settle all global trade and, in commodity terms, to buy oil and everybody needs oil and the Arabs and them muckers charge in dollars and only accept payment in dollars. Price in dollars and accept payment in dollars. Okay. Now, with that in mind, since 1971, since the 15th of August 1971, Sunday the 15th of August 1971, the currencies of the world have all been floating against the US dollar and the US dollar has been floating against nothing. It is imagined to have exaggerated value because of the demand for it. It's like having two different colors or a hundred different colors of monopoly money worth absolutely nothing. But because the hundred different monopoly players have to get one color in order to trade with one another. Everybody's fighting over that one color. And so the guy who owns that color of monopoly money, his money is worth more than it should be. All right. So now we come to this thing of the South African currency, the Rand over the past year. There are a couple of very simple explanations or a couple of really simple things to be said. The first is that when the West experienced a tremendous economical knock last year, the, 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 the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States printed trillions and trillions of dollars. So much so, and this is very, very important that by the end of November last year, the USA had printed into existence, in fact, not even printed. They didn't even pretend. They manufactured on computer screens. They, out of thin air, out of their thumbs, 26.2% from the 1st of January to the 30th of November last year, 26.2% of all of the dollars that had ever been created, and they were backed by nothing, except the contrived demand for them. But that printing was not in keeping with the demand. It, it, it had gotten totally carried away. It had no relationship to the true value through contrived demand of the dollar. It then turned out in mid January, I think the 11th of January, but I could be mistaken, that in fact, by the end of December last year, to 2020, 40%, so add a month, 40% of all of the dollars of all of history had been created. You can't even really use that word. Uh, invented, uh, perceived, pretended. 40% of all of the dollars of all time had been pretended in the year 2020. And that goes back to what is called the Coinage Act of 1792. So, 40% of all of the dollars 
created since 1792. 1992 would be 200 years, and 8 is 208, and 20 is 228 years. 40% of all of the dollars created in 228 years were created. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to say this. Your hero, Donald Trump, in 2020. Right. Actually, they were created by the Federal Reserve Banking System. But uh, you know full well who, who was kind of in charge at that time. And I'll mention something else to you, just to give you a sense of perspective on this thing. Donald Trump, in four years, increased the USA's debt by more than double what any of his predecessors had increased it by in any eight-year period. In other words, any president, Republican or Democrat, that had, had eight years to incur debt had incurred less than half of what Donald Trump did. And, and where a president only had four years and his successor had four years or eight years, if you took those two presidents' eight-year period together, four and four, he had, again, he again increased the USA's debt by more than double any of them did in double the time whether it was alone or two. I hope that that makes sense. Okay, so the result is that the US uh, dollar is teetering on the verge of collapse. Not because I say so, but because the profoundest voices in the world are saying so. It's not being reported very much in mainstream media. I'll give you an example. If you go, uh, if you hear that, um, oh, what's a good example that I can't be proved wrong? Because uh, I can't think exactly right now. But let's say you hear a rumor that ARK Invest, Kathy Wood, the great Tesla investor, she said there is no more value left in the market. You could search for a month of Sundays and not find that, that video. You could find excerpts on Bloomberg or Yahoo or wherever else where she speaks for five minutes before making that statement and five minutes after making that statement, but not that statement. You have to scratch quite hard to find the original sources of uh, these uh, prophecies of doom but they are there the greatest financial economic and fiscal voices in the world are saying kom groot moeilijkheid. so much so that one uh, bank ceo has warned of Weimar-like hyperinflation. The Weimar Republic was the Republic of Germany, the German Republic between uh, World War I and World War and uh, Hitler's ascension, more or less, before the establishment of the genuine Third Reich. Okay. And we all know that in the Weimar Republic, we all know the stories after World War I uh, and up to the time of the Great Depression, um, there was enormous joblessness and it cost a wheelbarrow full of notes uh, of Deutschmark to buy a loaf of bread and similar stories. Okay. So when the CEOs of the biggest banks in the world who stand to gain nothing by a crisis but stand to gain very much by pretending that there will not be a crisis or at least by postponing it. When they tell you that we're staring Weimar-like 
hyperinflation in the case in the face then you know there's a good reason to be concerned secondly it just stands to reason just imagine if we lived in a village and there were call it 10 families in the village and uh, we all paid in our own currencies i tore up uh, strips of paper from a pad and i wrote out you know 100 rand bought things from you over time somebody would say hey that simon you know he's paying out these uh, notes that he makes in his kitchen left right and center hand over fist and everybody knows he's got nothing to back it up the guy's a pauper and so we would by the way that was the case in germany 200 years ago this is long before world war one world war two it's a different story but at that time uh, monasteries, nunneries, um, guys with small pieces of land. I mean, like like miniature principalities, the size of literally uh, Renosterberg municipality, literally, literally, could make up their own currencies. And over time, it had to be resolved. It didn't work anymore. It was fixed. Anyway, <clears throat> it just stands to reason that sooner or later, we would say, all right, only the Jones family. They'll, they'll be responsible for money in our little village. We won't let Simon write out his own currency anymore. Uh, because there's no value to it. Now, if that Jones family got a little bit carried away and started creating more money than could be justified by the economy, and by the wealth of the village, people would lose confidence in it. So whether or not I tell you, or Saitlander says to you, or hysterical people on the internet say to you that there's coming a big crisis, there is coming a big crisis because the boffins are saying so, and because it stands to simple reason that sooner or later, if the USA prints an untold number of dollars that cannot be justified by its economy and is not justified by something like gold, that sooner or later people will lose confidence. And we're going back to the South Africa thing. So, since these rescue packages by the, 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 the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank and uh, the, the Federal Reserve Banking System of the United States, as money has been printed, it has been lent by the Federal Reserve Banking System to banks. Let's say, for instance, the Bank of America or JP Morgan, or Morgan Chase, or whatever. And they have lent it on. But, because their economies are in the doldrums, they've been lending it in their economies very reluctantly. They think they're not going to get their money back. So they've taken a two-fold approach, the banks have, to protect themselves. Firstly, they've charged the American uh, citizen fantastic, unbelievable rates of interest. For instance, uh, I was watching uh, something this morning by the Epic Economist, which some of you will know on uh, today, by the way, is the 24th of March. So when I say this morning, if you want to have a look, it was published. Uh, pretty sure it was on the 24th of March. It might have been the 23rd of March US time because I watched it quite early in the morning. And some US time zones were still in right. And it had been published a few hours before. So call it the 23rd of March. Okay. And I saw again, not for the first time, for the manyth time, how US banks over the past year have been charging US citizens, U.S. Lend, uh, uh, borrowers, between 25 and 40 percent interest on their credit cards. Obviously, that's different to other forms of loans or other types of loans, but it illustrates the point. Imagine paying 40 percent interest on your credit card. 
while they, the banks, have been borrowing that self-same money that they've been lending into people's credit cards. They, the banks, have been paying the Federal Reserve Bank nil interest, in some cases minus interest, if you can even believe it. I need to scratch my back. Just give me a second. Right, so it's an absolute scandal what's been going on. The second prong of their two-pronged attack to protect themselves from the crisis in the economies of the West is to invest the money very heavily, the money that they've received for free from the Federal Reserve Banks, which have uh, printed it or, or sucked it out of thin air, is to invest the money in emerging markets. In other words, to invest the money anywhere but at home. And now we come finally to the point. South Africa has been one of the beneficiaries of that because we are an emerging market. So in spite of the things that uh, have happened, the adverse events in South Africa over, loosely speaking, the past year, we have been beneficiaries of the fantastic throwing of money, hurling of money, at uh, of, of, of Western money at emerging markets. Now, there's another reason. Dogs. Just hold on. Now, there's another reason. A few years ago, Chris Hart who was a senior economist at Standard Bank. If I showed you a picture of him, you'd all recognize him. He's been on South African television over decades and decades. Wrote an article in which he said it's well understood in his circles, amongst senior economists, amongst the guys who pull the strings of the finances of the, the world, that part of the reason already a few years ago, why the South African Rand had not been, uh, its performance had not been a reflection of the reality on the ground in South Africa was partly because it was well understood that it was unacceptable to bet against the new South Africa rainbow nation in his circles, that everybody had to toe the line of the new South Africa. And that people could get into trouble for, for doing otherwise. So everybody had to pretend that things were hunky-dory and invest in the South African economy and the South African rand and South African bonds and so on in the spirit of uh, integration and harmony and postmodernist humanism and so on. Okay, so that's why the South African Rand has held its ground over this recent period of time in which its performance has not stood to reason. However, ultimately the house of cards must come crashing down. And that is why I have in this long, long story touched on the relationship between global currencies, including the Rand, and the US dollar. It was to make more than one point. <coughs> because the South African Rand, <coughs> excuse me, because the South African Rand floats like other currencies against the US dollar, which floats against nothing, which floats against sentiment, which floats against contrived value, which floats against contrived demand or floats on contrived demand. If the US dollar crashes, if all of these boffins to whom I've referred, not by name, but 
If all of these people who are saying that there is coming an enormous crisis with Weimar-like hyperinflation, if they are right, then the South African rand must crash fantastically. The Chinese have, over the past few years, there's a video that you can watch on this. It's by a guy called Dominic Frisbee. If you look it up on YouTube, D-O-M-I-N-I-C, Frisbee, F-R-I-S-B-Y, you'll quickly find the video. He does videos on various topics, quite a broad range, quite eclectic. But he has a video on Chinese buying up the world's gold. And he does a fantastic job of demonstrating something with facts, figures, data and statistics, with real evidence that few people have spoken about. And that is that the Chinese have surreptitiously, have furtively, have clandestinely bought up something like 34 to 36,000 tons of gold. Far more, far many times more than the next biggest holder of gold. We won't even go into that. And the reason is believed to be that they are insulating themselves against the inevitable collapse of the dollar. And like the Chinese, there will be other uh, nations who, who uh, are not as adversely affected uh, by the collapse of the U.S. dollar, this purported imminent collapse of the U.S. dollar, uh, as, as others. And there are various reasons for that. Gold holdings, the intrinsic, inherent value of those countries' economies. And the relationship between the size and the strength and the health of those economies. Oopsie, excuse me. Okie dokes, where were we? I have to apologize. That was a very important uh, uh, overseas call. And um, I've lost a little bit of track, but hopefully I can recover. So the, the, the story is uh, concerning this, uh, this South African currency. Ultimately, it has to fail if it is, if the experts are correct, including mainstream experts, including heads of banks, who have no interest in any kind of financial uh, debacle in saying that there must come a dollar collapse in 2021. Now, I would say to you that if it happens in 2022, they weren't very wrong because what we have happened, what we have seen over the past uh, period is that Collapses and crises have been postponed and delayed and drawn out and uh, 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 slowed down, slowed down, reined in time and time and time again. They can't be stopped. They, they, they can't. It's like the story I told you of the village and people making their own money and, you know, eventually it has to come to, uh, to a head. Simon has given uh, like uh, these post-it notes. He's he's given out a thousand of these, uh, but they're only worth uh, one cent each. And his debt against these is, you know, he pretends that they're worth a, a, a rand each. It could be that I uh, put up an argument in the town hall for a week. Saying, no, 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 it's not true. I've got money in the bank. Then it turns out that I don't have money in the bank. I say, no, 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 no. This is backed by a thousand goats. It turns out I've only got 300 goats. Somebody else could come up for me. And so the, the thing can be slowed down, which is what we've seen repeatedly over the past year, two years. So these guys are warning about a crisis in 2021, even if it happens in 2022. I, I personally will not begrudge them. I will not split hairs and say, oh, well, they were wrong. They were false prophets, uh, you know, kind of thing. There was much ado about nothing. A storm in a teacup, making a mountain out of a molehill too soon, too much too soon. 
I'll be one of those people who will say they were spot on. Because all of the evidence, all of the proof, all of the compelling reasons were there. Like a guy falling over the edge of the cliff. There's nothing wrong in saying he's going to die in 15 seconds. If the wind pushes him back and it takes another 15 seconds, the people who shouted hysterically that he was going to die, uh, we're not wrong, really. And that's what, what's cooking at the moment. So guys, this has been a 40 minute video. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for listening to the whole long story. I hope that I was able to tell it well enough for you to understand it clearly. And if nothing else, may it inspire you to prepare for difficult times ahead. They are almost certainly both inevitable and not far distant. Goodbye and God bless you.